Hello and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today my guest and I are going to introduce you to the Graduate School for Relationships and how you are going to find the light on the other side of divorce. So my guest today is a leading expert in healing, growing, and thriving both through and after divorce. In fact, I loved this, Tamron Hall called her the divorce whisperer in a recent interview, and her other moniker is the divorce doctor. So clearly, she knows her way around divorce, but not just divorce. You know, the traumas of life, the difficulties of life. Um, she, She has a great deal of experience in her own journey through some of them that she's going to share with us. So her name is Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, and she's a friend, a colleague, and she is the resource you've been looking for. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me here today. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure to be with you, Susan. Thank you for having me. It's good. We're going to have some, some interesting conversations today. Elizabeth and I always have interesting conversations. We were just talking about that. But first, let me just tell you a little bit about her. You know, I always like to tell my listeners, uh, you know, about the people that I'm bringing on, the experts that I'm bringing on. And expert truly uh, is the right word in this particular instance. Dr. Elizabeth is a clinical psychologist. She's the CEO and director of Dr. Elizabeth Cohen and Associates, which is located in New York City. Um, it's a group private practice which serves adults, children, and families. But Dr. Elizabeth works with people all over through telehealth. Um, so really, it's, it's, she's not limited to a New York City practice. And she's also the CEO and founder of an online divorce course and membership portal. And we're going to talk more about this, but I love the name. It's called Afterglow, the light on the other side of divorce. So I know you're all going to want to hear more about that. It's a 14 week program for women, but I suspect men could benefit. Um, Don't we all need an afterglow, right? So And yes, I think importantly, sure. Elizabeth has also been on her own divorce journey, which has, you know, like all of us in this divorce space who have been there and done it ourselves, I think it always informs us. So again, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here today. Me too. I'm so thrilled to be here. You know, so this is a topic, um, you know, we could talk about so many different things, you and I. And one thing I want to mention to my listeners, before we got started, I was talking to Elizabeth and she has agreed to come back on the show at a later date. So we're going to ask you and be thinking through this episode, what your questions might be. I mean, I have the divorce whisperer, the divorce doctor available to you. If you ha- could ask her questions, what would you want to know? Send those in to Divorce and Beyond Pod at gmail.com. Um, and, and we're going to have a later episode where we're going to actually get into your questions and topics. But for today, you know, so many of us, and, and I will put myself in this group, get stuck in divorce, get stuck in this process. And I always say to people, you know, divorce is not the rest of your life. It is a finite period of time, but there's something about it. And and, and I suspect it's because there's a level of trauma involved. And you and I have talked about trauma and and you've, you've educated me on this topic, but let's start there. What is trauma? What are we talking about when we say that word? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked this question, Susan. And I remember when we, when you said that really brilliant point about remember, divorce is not forever. That has really stuck with me. Your um, really smart thinking about remember, consider there will be something later. But when we're in a divorce or in any sort of trauma, it's very hard, as you said, to get out of that present moment of fear and panic. So similarly to if you were in a car accident, when you're in the car accident, you are not thinking about next summer when you're driving on the same road, totally healed and excited and happy. You are only in that one specific moment. So divorce is what we would consider in psychology a trauma because how we define trauma is something that happens quickly and intensely to us. Now, you might say, well, you know, we were wondering if we should get a divorce for a while. It didn't happen that quickly. We were, 
but for your nervous system, for your entire being, the suddenness of this relationship that I have been in for X amount of time, even if it was unhealthy, is now ending. That moment of it is now over is shocking, startling, and intense for your nervous system, just like a car accident. Think about it. You're driving along. You're having a great time. I know you have a convertible, right? You're, yeah. you're dri- imagine you driving around your convertible, right? Having a great time, listening to music. And then what happens is this sudden shift happens where you thought you were going to do something that day. And now your story of the day is totally different. And that's what happens in marriage and divorce. You think you're going to be with this person forever. And then suddenly you have to adjust to, nope, wrong story, different story. And that takes a toll on our bodies, our hearts, and our minds. I, I, that is the perfect analogy for it, the car accident. I, I long ago in my life was also in a, a difficult car accident and, and your future changes. And I think there is that key to what you were just saying, because it is not that you know, you, so when you're married or in a relationship, you see a certain future. And even if things aren't going well, I think part of the trauma is it's not just that the future you thought you had disappeared but, or in a flash, in a moment, but also that the future is now kind of a, I always call it the black hole or an abyss, right? You don't even know what's in that space. And that has to add to the trauma. Absolutely. Really good point. And now, given where we are, the with people I work with who are going through a divorce have the unknown of what's happening with their divorce and the unknown of what's happening with the pandemic. So you have to realize that every single unknown we have kind of piles on top of it that itself. And so I talk with clients who are going through a divorce and really ask them and start to, to look at what other traumas they might have had in their life. Because, you know, if you're from a marginalized, systemically oppressed group, that's a trauma. If you have had, you know, verbal, emotional abuse, or even neglect, or parents that were a poor fit, those all kind of create the base that then the divorce trauma is on top of. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes a perfect sense. And it's actually like ringing all kinds of bells for me right now, because mm-hmm. you mentioned the trauma of the pandemic, of living through COVID. You know, we are taping this episode in August of 2020. In the Now we're five months into this with no end in sight. Um, and that's kind of like divorce, right? I always call that period of divorce, divorce limbo, which is also to me, Dante's eighth rung of hell, right? That, that he never wrote about. Because we don't know as we live in, in the world today, what the, uh, the new future is going to look like in this after COVID time period, nor when it will be. Right. So I wonder if you can even notice, and maybe some of your listeners can notice that as you say those words, there's a bit of spiraling. You can kind of feel your, your maybe I feel my face get warm. I feel myself getting a little bit dizzy. And that's the physiological response to the overwhelm of not knowing what's going to happen. And that is how many people, when they're going through a divorce, are walking around having to make, as you know, the biggest decisions of their life. So you're going through this trauma where your body is completely activated and you're, and some people are so what we call dissociated, having such an out of body experience and they're supposed to be doing their financials. They're supposed to be figuring out custody. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most impossible time to even tie your shoes, let alone make these huge decisions. So I really think it's essential for people who are going through a divorce to get guidance and help on how to regulate and help their nervous system through this trauma so that they can make the best decisions for themselves for their future. Right. Well, and that is, you know, I've talked about that in other episodes. I've talked about it when I've been on other, you know, podcasts and shows and interviews. Um, You have to deal with the emotional content of your divorce while you're going through it if you want to be able to make 
appropriate decisions, decisions that are going to help you thrive into that afterglow as we were talking. Exactly. About. And I say to clients all the time, you can glance, but not stare at the past. I'm not saying we have to revisit your entire relationship, but we need to process some of the loss, some of the grief, some of the anger. We need to do some processing in the moment so that you can really be at your best for this next amazing chapter. Right. Well, and that's, there's a key right there that I think I want to drill down on because so many people don't glance back. They are, they are sitting, facing out the rear view mirror or the rear view window of their car. And they are so focused and immersed in, I'm going to use that word loss that you use, used, that they are completely unable to even consider that there's a forward or in many cases, even a now. They are just yes. so lost in loss. So yes. how, what would, what are some tips that you might give people for how to even work through loss? Yeah. So it makes me think again with the analogy of the car accident. I know when I've been in a car accident, you know, I think to myself, oh, I sh if I had only left five minutes earlier or if that car wasn't driving there, but then I'm taking a left it, instead of a right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But it doesn't matter for every subsequent drive you have to take. It doesn't matter what happened in that drive. Right. So it's, you're really, really harping and focusing on it. It, it doesn't help you with what both of you, you and I believe very strongly is in moving forward. Now, as far as the grief, being a clinical psychologist, I think that's something very unique that I bring to, to my work, which is the ability to kind of sit with grief and to allow it to be. I think that's really the key is not to push it away. So many people feel like you can either feel grief or relief from leaving your marriage, that you can't have both. And as you know, one of my favorite statements is having the golden and, that you can feel two things at one time. I personally never want to be married to my ex again, and I had a lot of grief I had to move through. Just a few um, months ago, my ex-husband came up to visit and he was with his son and my kids and we were all at the pool. And suddenly this feeling came over me and I've been divorced for 10 years, happily remarried, you know, really don't want to get back together with my ex, <laughs> but felt this moment of, oof, this is what I wanted. I actually wanted this and I have to grieve that I wanted that. And so I let myself cry. I let myself feel it. And the whole time I had this voice in my head saying, but you don't want to be with him, but you don't want to be with him. And I kept re reassuring myself, that's okay. I can feel both things at the same time. And so I think allowing yourself to realize it's grief is really important. And to realize that there is also relief, that there's both. Well, and that's, you know, it makes me think of so many people that I've spoken to as I've helped them, through, you know, as a, from a legal perspective through divorce, but people share their emotional content as well. And so many people will say that it's not the loss of the person, it's the loss of the dream, or it's the loss yeah. of the perception of the relationship that yes. they thought they had um, that is so hard for them. So that's what you Actually, can grieve, right? Absolutely. Exactly. I have a part in my program actually where I have this whole process where we write down what your fairy tale was, really what you thought the fantasy was going to be. And I have them write it or record it and then do a letting go ritual of really either burning it or ripping it up and really allowing this letting go of exactly what you said, this dream of what it was going to be. Also, so you can make room for the most amazing part of your life, which is coming next, because you can't create unless you allow yourself to go of what you thought was going to happen. Yeah. Well, that ha harkens back like psychologically. To our, we, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just thinking that harkens back to what our, our friend Jill Sharer Murray says about the unstoppable power of letting go, right? It's all about building uh, or letting go of what is holding us back so that we can, can move forward. And that's a lot of internal work, not external work. Absolutely. And it takes a real desire, 
I talk about this a lot to say, okay, this crappy thing might have happened to me. My ex might have done some things that really upset me. But the only person I can control is myself. The only thing I can do is work on me, my patterns of behavior, my grief, my loss, my anger. That's the only thing I have control over. So if you're ready to do that work, then you will have an amazing next chapter. But if you don't want to look at yourself and do some of that work, it's, it's going to be a long time of suffering. Yeah. It's, and that's where the people, I think the frustration comes in and, and we see this all the time is people spending a huge amount of energy on trying to change their ex into what they do want them to be. Like if you just understood how you're failing in as a father or as a mother or as a spouse, then this would all work out. So there, and that brings up another topic that I absolutely want to touch on because you used a phrase in one of the interviews that you did. I think it was the one with Tamron Hall, which by the way, people all have a link to in the um, show notes, but you used the phrase and I love it. I wrote it down. I highlighted it righteous anger. You have to feel your righteous anger. And, you know, anger hurts probably the number one emotion I think people feel during divorce, but anger is right bringing up the, the close uh, on the rear. So, you, you know, this is a big one for people. You actually mentioned in that interview, a great coping mechanism that you used in divorce. And I actually used it myself um, and use it during stressful times. So let's talk about righteous anger. anger. Absolutely. I think it's important to note it, note that we have a very negative relationship with anger in our culture. We see anger as destructive. We see it as threatening. And while maybe some people act out their anger in that way, anger is an emotion that is experienced in our brain in the same way joy, love, happiness is. It's a neural feedback loop. It hap it's, it's, it's neutral in the same way that all of those emotions are. It's simply physiological. So I talk about righteous anger because I hate the shame that there is around anger for overall. And I think that when you have been hurt and someone has deceived you or you have been misunderstood, you have an absolute right to feel angry. And that's righteous anger. But we don't know how to handle that. Very often people will say, well, what's the point of telling another person they're not going to change? And I understand that. Sometimes it, it's not going to land well on someone. So what do you do with that? Well, unfortunately, that means we hold it in our bodies and some people end up getting back aches. There's a lot of research to show that lower back pain is a lot linked very strongly to anger. You know, we get headaches, you know, we hold it in our bodies. And so the, the, um, the strategy and the tool that I like to use that you just mentioned is really allowing it to move through your body by listening to music that brings that feeling to you. Now, I don't know if you, Susan, if this happened to you, you said you listened to ACDC, but for me, I thought, me, I'm not angry at all. I remember someone saying like, you have a lot of anger. Me? Oh no, I'm so nice. Just ask anyone. Well, <laughs> all I needed to do was two things. One was put on Rage Against the Machine um, and my body just moved. It was, I was punching the air. I was kicking. I mean, my body was so in like lust for allowing myself to have this release. Um, I did that and I enrolled in a kickboxing class and I was like the hardest punching the hardest of anyone there. And I thought, where is this coming from? It was here. I just couldn't, my mind wasn't allowing me to, to, acknowledge it, but my body needed to release it. And then after I felt wonderful. That song is about three, the song I listened to is about three minutes. And after three minutes, I really felt like I had had a huge release as if I had had a conversation with someone about my anger. So I really want to encourage people to ask their bodies what they need, put on some music, punch a pillow, really allow yourself to feel the anger. Because as a beautiful quote, I think they say the Buddha said this, that, whole, that being angry at someone is like holding hot coals and throwing them at, at someone else. Only you get burned. So you are getting burnt all the time. You have to let it move through your body so it can release. That is so perfect. And I can absolutely see you with your headphones in, kicking and punching. 
But that's exactly, I, I go for a run and I, I play Metallica and ACDC and all this like loud metal, like rock, heavy metal uh, music, but it makes me feel better. It makes yeah. me, so it's the combination of that physical movement, kickboxing yeah. as well. If you hit a heavy bag or kick, kick something rather than punching it air for me, if I actually can punch something, man, that helps. That definitely yeah. helps you. And just, yeah. you know, what I hope listeners just heard was the permission to feel the anger. If, if you need that permission, we don't, uh, nice is your superpower, nice is my superpower, right? That's, <laughs> we are nice people. I try to help people. That's my, my goal in life. That's why I do all of these things. That's why I'm sure you came to the profession in which you are in. You help people every day. We're nice people, but you know what? We still can be hurt and be angry and need to move through those things. And so can everyone who's listening. Absolutely. And I want to be really clear that having murderous, rageful feelings is not the same thing as acting out on those. It's very important for people to understand that feelings and actions are different. I talk about this a lot with jealousy. People really don't like to feel jealous. It feels like a, you know, we talk about it as green and gross and you sh there's nothing wrong with feeling jealous. In fact, if you notice that you feel jealous of someone, I usually say, allow yourself to feel it. And then when you feel comfortable, ask that person, hey, how did you get what I had, what you have? I'd love to get it. Tell me all about your process. Like, don't run away from icky feelings because then they will just override you. I promise. That is how the body works. We can talk about this maybe in another episode about the fight, flight, or freeze response. Yes. But if we don't allow ourselves to feel feelings, we get frozen or we get fighty with, you know, store clerks. We need to allow this to move through our bodies. Again, Susan, these pe people who are going through a divorce are making incredibly important decisions. I want their minds and bodies to be as grounded and as clear as possible. That's, you know, first I have to point out the very technical term, icky feelings. <laughs> so yeah. everyone out there, if you're feeling icky feelings, <laughs> let yourself feel the icky feelings. But that is true. We do spend our lives tamping down. I spent, uh, you know, I'm 55 now. I spent the first 40 years of my life, probably just not being angry, not being jealous, not being any of those things that doesn't serve us. Um, but the, the, no. that distinction between the feelings and the actions is, is a very important one. I'm just listening to the podcast, the Betty Broderick story. That is a person mm. who felt the feelings and let them come out as actions. Clearly not what we're talking about here, but you exactly. also focus on the flip side of the emotions. And this I think is going to be hard for people to grasp who are in the throes of trauma. You talk about finding pleasure, finding pleasure in life and that's not where people are when they're going through trauma. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think, as you point out, it's a key to, to moving through this and to getting to the afterglow. So let's talk about pleasure a bit. Oh, I love to talk about pleasure. Ooh, I love it. Um, so just, so pleasure is a secret weapon that we all have that we simply don't know we have. We just don't. Again, I, I mean, I think pleasure has been associated with, I'll have fun um, once all the hard stuff is over. Um, I'll have fun once my divorce papers are signed. Like this kind of waiting for the pleasure as opposed to allowing it to seep in a little bit when we're struggling. Now, it makes sense um, biologically that you wouldn't be throwing yourself into pleasure when you're going through a trauma. You're going through it, uh, going through a trauma, you need to be conserving all your energy and really be focused on, you know, am I safe? And to really feel pleasure, you need to feel open and safe. But we can consciously bring small little bits of pleasure into our situation. For example, one of my favorites, I, I should have worn it today, is that I bought this silky robe that any time I was having a call with my lawyer, I would put it on. And I just loved the way it felt against my skin. Or a candle that I always burned, a beautiful scent that I really liked. Yep, there you go. When <laughs> right I was next to my something, Buddha. <laughs> right next to your Buddha. When I was doing something hard. 
So bringing pleasure or I've had clients that I've recommend that have recommended that I've recommended to them to if you if you feel comfortable doing your hair and putting lipstick on and dressing up if you want when you're going to court to file your paper you know something totally challenging to bring a little bit of pleasure to bring a bit a little bit of light to it um, because that's the moment where you can see oh wait my whole life is not halted because of this divorce I know it feels like that. But if you can try and find some tiny holes, uh, taking a long bath, painting your nails, even just doing a hand massage with lotion, if you can find those small moments, it will help orient you more towards safety and less towards trauma. Which is, you know, really, it, it's that moment of, I'm trying to think of the things that I do, you know, just to decompress. You, you mentioned earlier, we were talking about getting away, you know, to nature um, and, and laying in the grass, you know, or I, I tend to do it. I don't know that I lay in the grass, but I will go walk barefoot in the grass, um, you know, or, or get up early just to watch that sun come up over, you know, over the, the horizon um, and yes. finding the pleasure in those moments or just finding pleasure in a moment of quiet, which most of us don't have too much of these days as we are confined to our homes to large degree. So that is okay. something I think people very much put on hold. Um, whether it be a large pleasure or a small pleasure, um, it, while yeah. they're going through a difficult time. Yeah. I think that we really need to reframe, um, our experiences as needing, you know, there's some research that shows that we need three positive statements for every one negative statement we say to kind of, because our brains are Velcro to negative information and Teflon to good. And I think it's the same with pleasurable events. In fact, when people are struggling with depression as a cognitive behavioral therapist, the number one behavioral intervention we do is scheduling pleasurable events. It kicks the brain out of that um, depression, wallowing pain, and gets them into a moment of joy. And really, all that joy is, is a ton of moments of joy piled up together. Oh, well, there's, there's my little quote for this show. <laughs> I'm putting that one out there. Look on Instagram, people. That is yeah. perfect. <laughs> and please, and please don't think also, some people think, well, if I'm having a good time or if I'm joyful, then somehow the other person has won or I'm showing that their behavior was acceptable. No, you are simply watering yourself in a way so you can grow. Because this is your life, babe. Like, this is yeah. you. This is your life. Like, you are the one. I have a section in my program, too, called Living Your Life by Design, Not by Default. Like, you can design this life. And so, yes, we will spend time with the pain, but we got to spend time with the joy because that will just make your life actually full and complete and have all of it in it instead of just black and white. And, and what a perfect note is that, you know, even during the time of trauma, there's a balance between both the bad and the good, and you can find the joy. And I know that is a large part of your Afterglow program. Tell us just a little bit about that. I know we'll have all the information so that listeners can find your program and you, but tell us a little bit about Afterglow. When would people start? Yeah. What, how does it work? Yeah. So it's opened um, three times a year. Um, it'll be open again in September. Um, and basically when I was getting divorced, I couldn't find a comprehensive program to help me heal. I had to piece all these parts together. And even as a psychologist, I found it really hard. So I just wanted a place for people to go heal and learn how to deal with co-parenting, dating, living life by design, just the whole package. And then once so many people were enrolled in it, they wanted to continue. So I created this membership where we meet every week to connect and circle together because people can feel so isolated through divorce. Well, and, and just to note to everyone, you're there guiding people through the program the entire Correct. way. So for those of you who are listening, who hear the wisdom and the experience of, of Dr. Elizabeth, just imagine having that guiding force through your process. Um, and you actually, as a special gift for listeners have a 14-day program that's about to start that you're offering to them. Why don't you tell us about that? 
Yeah. So going along with pleasure, I have a free journey to help transform you into the most radiant, full of life, sexiest, what I call superwoman or man post-divorce in only 14 days. And so this is a guided journey by me helping you really get more embodied, connected to yourself so that you can do the things we we're talking about, like make good decisions and be present for your children. So this is a way for you to really get what I was talking about before, the balance of joy and feel all the feelings that you feel in 14 days for free. I'm signing up. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll see me there, everyone Great. who doesn't want. Well, and just the idea of finding more joy in our lives, whether you're going through a difficult trauma or, hey, just wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to have a little bit more pleasure and joy in our lives? So um, I will have the link to the registration page for your program. Um, please let everybody know how they can find you. Yes. So you can find me at DrElizabethCohen.com. That's D-R. And I love to hear from people. I love questions. I love curiosity. And don't worry, any question you have asked is I've heard before. I can, I'm happy to answer all of them. And I'd love to hear from anyone who has any questions. Well, wonderful. And I want to mention you are um, the Divorce Doctor on Instagram. I'm the that Divorce Doctor Instagram, yeah. And I also have a um, weekly pod, uh, blog on psychology today. Okay. So that's called the Divorce Course. And if people are interested, I cover a lot of topics there. Um, and I do, I'll do Instagram lives um, on those as well. So you can find me at the Divorce Doctor on Instagram. Absolutely. And that's how we found each other. So I yes. highly recommend following her. Um, and again, just to remind everyone, Dr. Elizabeth has very kindly said she is going to come back and we're going to have a follow-up episode. So please, you know, whatever questions you might either want to follow up on from this episode or other questions you might want to ask her going forward, we'll be having that episode in uh, probably in a couple of weeks. So please write in and it will be um, divorce and beyond pod at gmail.com. So thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm so thrilled that we finally got to do this episode. I'm excited that we're going to get to do another one. And I hope that, you know, people who listen hear that one, it's okay to feel some of the negative emotions that they're experiencing right now, but also it is possible to find joy in their lives. And um, I encourage everyone to reach out to you and, and start looking for that afterglow as well. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a great privilege to be here. Thank you.